Welcome to the Thursday night Bible study tonight, 1st John. This is the same John that was the apostle of Jesus Christ, that was with Jesus Christ, apparently for three and a half years in his earthly ministry. One of the 12 that was sent out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel in Matthew chapter 10. The author of the book of John as well. This first John and John are ascribed to John. I don't think there's any traditional uh, and long historical claim to anybody else being the author. And we're going to see tonight there are a lot of similarities between the book of John and first John. Let's start in verse one. That which was from the beginning, which we heard, we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and shew unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us. John is showing, I'm an eyewitness, I'm an eyewitness. The Holy Spirit is showing, here's an eyewitness. Here's an eyewitness of the word of life, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. This man heard him, the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw him, looked upon him, and he handled him in that he, I'm sure they, you know, put their arms around each other and, and so forth. And yet he identifies him as the word of life. And this is similar to what Peter proclaimed to let you know, here we've got an eyewitness is preserved in the word of God of God in the form of a man during his, his, his earthly ministry. And let's go to, let's turn back to 2 Peter because it's similar to what 2 Peter was proclaiming that, hey, Peter's an eyewitness. John's an eyewitness. James is an eyewitness. Let's turn back to 2 Peter chapter 1. And let's start in verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And remember, we studied this. This is when Jesus Christ went up onto a mountain, up into a mountain, and he brought with him Peter, James, and John. And he was transfigured up in that mountain. He was transfigured such that his face shined like the sun. And he had on him in his transfiguration on the mount, Elijah on one side of him and Moses on the other. And the father spoke in front of those eyewitnesses, Peter, James, and John, and proclaimed, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So Peter is recounting this. Eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This differentiates him from every man that ever lived. Because no man that ever lived would be transfigured and shine like the sun. No man that ever lived would have the father come and speak to him while he's transfigured and bring people back from the dead, Moses and Elijah, raise them up and present them with them so that these three witnesses could write about it, Peter, James, and John, and you read about it in the book of Matthew and other gospel events. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Let's go back to 1 John. So that was in 2 Peter. 
in first john he is likewise pointing out i saw him and i heard him and i laid my hands on him i was with him but he's pointing out something else about him first john uh, chapter one He's saying the one he saw, the one he heard, the one he laid his hands on, looked upon, is the word of life. That's very similar to what he, in John, the book of John, chapter one, we're in first John, chapter one here, but in the book of John, chapter one, John proclaimed, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was god here in first john he's called the word of life there are three names for him one is the word of life in verse one verse two for the life was manifested that's another name for him the life was manifested that means he was shown and we have seen it and bear witness and shew unto you that eternal life which was with the father and was manifested unto us was with the father the word of life one name from the life another name from eternal that eternal life another name for him who was with the father and was manifested unto us it's very similar to the book of john where in the beginning was the word and the word was with god here the word was with the father there the word was with God and there the word was God and it clearly said who the word was that it was the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of John here it's clear who it is as well but these three names of his the word of life the life and he, and that eternal life are one of many many names that God has because God has many functions. God has many offices. God, as we discussed two weeks ago, is infinite. There's no limit to God. He is almighty. And you'll see his different names all mean something important. He's a word of life because he spoke life into existence. He's always existed as a word of life. He spoke the world into existence. And when he returns, he's going to come back. You read about him in the book of Revelations, coming back on a white horse. And he has a name, the word of God. Here he's the life because all life comes from him. He's the life that gives everything that ever had life, life. You read it. We read about that in the book of John chapter one. In him was life. John chapter 4, I believe it is. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the life. And in this context, often the life means eternal life. The life that's going to last forever. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and chew on you. That eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That's another name for him. Why is he called eternal life? Because he's the source of it. The scriptures indicates that only in him dwelleth immortality. He's the part of God that is eternal life, and that's where you get eternal life. And we're all going to die. And if we're going to get eternal life, we're going to get it from him. He's a reservoir of eternal life. He is the only place in the universe you're going to get eternal life. Of course, he's one with the Father and he's one with the Holy Spirit. We're going to read about that in 1 John. All three of those are one. The Word, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are all one. They're all part of God, but they're all, they have different offices. They have, God makes distinctions between them. People try to limit them and say, no, he's the Son of God. And they're leaving out all these other names for him. The word of life. 
They're leaving out that he's the only wise God that we read about in the epistles. They're leaving out that he is God manifest in the flesh that we read about in the epistles. They're leaving out that he's God, our righteousness in the book of Jeremiah chapter 23. They're leaving out that he's a mighty God of Isaiah chapter nine. They're leaving out that he is uh, God, the son, that he is the, oh God, that the father refers to as God in the Old Testament and in the book of Hebrews. They leave all that out and say, he's only the son of God. That stems from incredible Bible ignorance, such that it should never come forth from the pulpit. Nobody should ever teach such ignorance. He is all these different things. He accomplishes all these different things. The father, by the way, gave him all judgment. So he's going to judge everybody that ever lived. And then he delegated the judgment to the church, the body of Christ in Israel. And you're going to see when he robbed all these forces of evil around the universe that God Almighty gave. God Almighty, he created all of them, by the way. And when they rebelled against God, they had offices and they had power and principalities and royalty and might and dominions and all those. When Christ died on the cross, he stripped them of their authority. He stripped them of their legal authority and offices. They're still exercising those things. So he didn't strip them of their power yet, but he stripped that away from them and he delegated it to the church, the body of Christ and the future believers of Israel and took it away from them and raised us up above everything by his act on the cross, his resurrection and ascension. Raised us up above all the principalities, powers, mights and dominions and every name that is named not only in this world and that which is to come. The Bible says all judgment was given unto him, but he tells us we're going to judge the world and we're going to judge angels. Israel's told they're going to sit on 12 tribes judging the 12. They're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So he's delegated that power and authority to the believers and he stripped it from the ungodly angels and the ungodly people and all of these rulers and everybody all over the universe that rebelled against him. They're all going to be weak forever. And Satan is thrown down into hell. In Isaiah 14, the kings down there and their hierarchies in hell they say to him have you become weak like us and he's covered with worms on one side and covered with worms on another side yeah jesus christ on the cross accomplished that and that's one of the things he is in addition to all these things that proclaim he's god he is also the son of God and the son of man and the man Christ Jesus. He was a man. And the man Christ Jesus did not want to go to that cross. He prayed to the father that that cup of suffering and misery, misery and humiliation and being separated from almighty God, the father and the pain and the horrors of it all would be taken away from him. He was in great suffering and misery in the, in the garden of Gethsemane, the man, Christ Jesus, he knew what he was facing. He didn't want to go through it. People say, look, he's a man. See, he's just a man. Oh yeah, ignore all the other names for him in the Bible then, if you want to go that route. You're wrong and you're ignorant. No, he wasn't just a prophet. He was a prophet. And Moses prophesied of that prophet that was to come, that you better do what he says. And that's my paraphrase of it or else it's going to be required of you. Just like it was when they rebelled against Moses, the ground would swallow them up and God would make it so that whole families would be swallowed up by the, by the earth, into the earth. And he would burn them up with fire because they fought against Moses. And Moses warned, there's this prophet coming. Jesus Christ is a prophet among many other things. He's a minister of the circumcision. So he has all these different names. Now, Paul, getting back to the eyewitnesses, so Paul, Peter, James, and John, all were eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ. They saw him in a glorified form. Paul saw him when he was on the road to Damascus, and Jesus was brighter than the sun. He was so bright, he was brighter than the noonday sun. 
and you don't want to look upon the noonday sun. Paul was blinded, and fell to the earth. Let's go back to, uh, we're getting back into First uh, John. And uh, why don't we turn to First John uh, chapter 1, verse 5. I want you to notice, I want you to be pay special attention to what we're going to read in First John and compare it to the book of John. You're going to see all these similarities. It's another book which is admittedly very confusing, just like First and Second Peter. Because you see that they appear to be given eternal life. They appear to be have that salvation. And then there's other verses in there that indicate they have to keep commandments. They have to abide in him. They have to confess their sins to receive forgiveness of sins. If they don't walk in him, they're in darkness and they suffer wrath. Just like the book of John. You see stuff where they've received eternal life, it appears. And then you see they got to walk. In the light they have to walk in jesus christ they have to abide in him and if not they're liars and they're in darkness and they don't know god this is so different from the doctrine and the dispensation of grace if they keep his commandments if they walk in him then they know that he's their friend that he's there with him and they know him on the dispensation of grace, we're told that if we believe the gospel, the grace of God, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We're told in Ephesians 1 that we're sealed until the day of redemption of the purchased possession. So we know that we belong to God forever. You're going to see a lot of contingent connection with God. Only if they do this, then they have that connection. And that security. You'll see other verses which seem to indicate they have eternal life. Admittedly, it's a confusing book. It is not the doctrine of the dispensation of grace. It is not the doctrine you read about in Ephesians and Colossians. I want you to pay attention to that and think about that as we go through these verses. Uh, let's go. We're back in 1 John chapter 1. Please turn to verse 5. This then is the message we have which we have of him and declare unto you that god is light and in him is no darkness at all if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth if you walk in darkness if you're not walking the right way you don't have fellowship with him but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and if they walk in the light the work of walking in the light abiding in him. Then they have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. But that's if we walk in the light. Well, in Ephesians chapter one, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, not according to us walking in the light, according to the riches of his grace. These are two separate, distinct contradictory doctrines and that's why you got to rightly divide the word of truth and realize you're in the dispensation of grace you're saved and sealed and forgiven already god for christ's sake hath forgiven you these people must walk in the light just like they have to endure unto the end to be saved in matthew 24 this is a reference in first john we're going to read how it's the last time it's definitely a tribulational book and that's a gospel that's preached in all the world in the great tribulation in Matthew 24. This gospel of the kingdom, a variation of it. And this gospel of the kingdom. If they walk in the light, they have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses them from all sin. Now, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our, us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So they have to, in order to receive forgiveness of sins, they have to confess their sins. Is it an ongoing thing? Yes, because they have to abide in him. And if they don't abide in him, they suffer the wrath of God. Just like in Matthew 24, just like we read in Luke and the book of John, just like we read in the book of Mark. If they don't continue in that work of walking with him, they get cut in, cut in half and they get their portion. They get the just punishment of God. 
when Christ returns that the unbelievers get and the hypocrites receive. Now, we're safe from the wrath to come. So that doctrine cannot apply to us. It cannot apply to anybody that's in the church, the body of Christ, and in the dispensation of grace that has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, believed he died for their sins and he was buried and he was raised from the dead. That person, we've studied this over and over and over again. That person in Romans 5, 9 is much more being then justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. That person saved from wrath. It's not so with these people under this gospel of the kingdom. Let's go, we're going to go back to the book of John, chapter 15, and we're going to see doctrines there, and then we're going to see identical doctrines in 1 John. Please turn back to the book of John, chapter 15. And by the way, I might add that Ephesians 1 does proclaim that he has uh, given us redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. But Ephesians 4 proclaims that God, for Christ's sake, have forgiven us. We're already forgiven. Not a word about us confessing our sins to receive forgiveness of sins, as we just read in 1 John. Not a single word about that in Ephesians 4 or in uh, Ephesians 1 or in Colossians 1, where it says that we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Not a single word about confessing your sins to receive that. The only thing they did in Ephesians was believe by grace through faith without works. So John chapter 15, we're going to do a comparison here and pay careful attention to the, what we read in here and compare it to what we're going to see in 1 John. John chapter 15. Start in verse 6. If a man abide not in me, and I'm skipping over some parts up here in, in the beginning of chapter 15, where they are to abide in him. They are to stay in Christ. They are to walk in him. If they don't abide in him, then they're not a partaker of him. That's like the book of Hebrews. If they keep that firm on to the end, they're a partaker of Christ. They're not part of Christ's house unless they keep it firm on to the end. Similar doctrine here. They got to abide in him. They got to abide in him. And if they abide in him, they bring forth fruit. If they don't abide in him, they do not bring forth fruit. And if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. That's what happens to those that don't abide in him. Just like what John the Baptist said about it, that Christ is, is, is a consuming fire in effect. And if they don't stay and bring forth, uh, fruit, meat for repentance, then they suffer the wrath of God. Now, the other thing you'll notice about them, and we'll see this in 1 John, if they abide in him, they bring forth fruit, but they also can ask him for anything in faith. And when they ask him for things, he, he gives it to them. They can pray for things and they'll receive it. Verse 7, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. You're going to see that in 1 John as well. So not only do they have to, and you'll see they have to keep his commandments, by the way. But they'll ask for things from him and he'll give it to them if they abide in him. And that's a condition. Verse 10, if ye keep my commandments. You shall abide in my love. The condition of them abiding in his love is to keep his commandments. If you do that, you shall abide in my love. It couldn't be, this is plain English. This is very simple. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. That's a condition of abiding in his love here. In Romans chapter 8, nothing separates us from the love of God. In Romans 8. Nothing, things present, things to come, not any other man, nothing. And who is the us in Romans 8? It's those that have been justified by faith in Romans 5. It's those that have believed that Jesus died for them and was delivered for offenses and raised for our justification in Romans 4. It's those that believed 
on the Lord Jesus Christ in Romans chapter 3. It's those that believe the gospel of Christ and they got saved in Romans 1. And what happens to them? Nothing separates them from the love of God. Here, it's very different. Clearly different. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. That's a condition. One of the commandments was you got to love one another. We'll see that here in the book of John. We'll see that in first John as well. This is my command that you love one another as I have loved you. If they called their brother a fool, they were in danger of hellfire. That's what Jesus Christ preached. They had to love one another. And they had to believe that Jesus was a Christ as well. The son of God. Look at verse 14. Ye are my friends. If, here's a condition, you do whatsoever I command you. They do whatsoever he commands them, then he, then, then they're his friends. Let's go back to 1 John. Let's see if we see any of these things that we read about in uh, the book of John. 1 John, um, I'm probably going to be jumping around a bit. Let's go to... Uh, Chapter 2. It's interesting, this admonition. Um, well, let's go to chapter 2 and verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that... Aunt that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. That's very similar to Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, the Lord Jesus Christ warned, there are all going to be all these people, false prophets. And he warned about the Antichrist that Daniel wrote about. And he said, they're gonna, there's going to be some saying, Christ is here and Christ is there and all these false Christs and the Antichrist. And they're going to be there to deceive. Here, little children, it is the last time. As you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. That's clearly a tribulational prediction. Because it hasn't been the last time for the last 1,900 years of the dispensation of the grace of God. He's not proclaiming it's a dispensation of the grace of God, that's for sure. As Paul did. Let's go to, and I want to turn back to 1 John chapter 2 over another thing that's in there. But let's go to um, 1 John uh, chapter 3. And we'll come back to chapter 2. See if you recognize any of this that we read about in the book of John. Chapter 3 verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Now you're thinking, okay, he's there to take away our sins, so therefore our sin is surely forgiven. But watch verse 6. Whoso abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not. Well, let me, let me repeat that. Just like we read that you had to abide in him in the book of John. Here in 1 John chapter 3, whoso abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. So if you're sinning under this program, you haven't seen him and you don't know him. In fact, you're of the devil. If you're continuing to sin, you're of the devil under this program. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For this, the devil sinneth from the beginning. And under this program, if you're born of God, you don't commit sin. Verse 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him. He's abiding in Christ. He does not commit sin because he is born of God. Go down to verse 22. So I kept on saying there'd be language like John. Um, yes. 
Verse 22, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Why are they receiving whatever they ask of him? Just like in the book of John, remember? That they kept his commandments, they abided in him and those things. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Why? Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. That's why they get what, what they ask of him. Now, Paul asks Christ three times to get rid of the vexation that he had in his flesh, a messenger of Satan that God allowed Satan to abuse Paul physically in some way, buffet him. Three times Paul asked God to get rid of it and God did not do it. So he didn't receive what he asked. You know you pray for things all the time and you don't receive them. But these people under this gospel, the kingdom program, and in the tribulation, when they, if they're abiding in Christ and they're keeping his commandments, whatsoever they ask from the Father, they receive it. Verse 22, whatsoever we ask, we receive of, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now, here are his commandments. Verse 23, one of his commandments. It, it's plural commandments, but here's one of his commandments, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Nothing about believing he died for you and was raised from the dead, but believing on the name of the son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Verse 24, think about this. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. Where And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. He that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him. If you, what does it mean? If you don't keep his commandments, you don't dwell in him. You do not dwell in him if you don't keep his commandments. How does that compare, though, to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 12, 13, and 14? It says that after you believe, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And you believe the gospel, your salvation. It doesn't say you're keeping commandments. It said after you believe, you got sealed. Ephesians 4 proclaimed also that you should not grieve the Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. It doesn't say as long as you keep his commandments, then you're going to dwell in him. These are very different doctrines. I want to go, I wanted to go to 1 John, back to 1 John chapter 2, but instead I'm not going to do that. I want to go to, I'm going to go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. This is another one of those passages that shows that Jesus Christ is certainly God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. I think it's verse 7. Let me double check that. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. Yes, for there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and we know who the Word is from John chapter 1 and from 1 John, the Word of life, that he saw, that he touched, and so forth, he heard. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. That's the one God. But many parts of the one God. Because the Father has certain offices and things that he does, many different things you see he's doing. The Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, has many different offices that he does and did and will do. And the Holy Spirit has many different offices that the Holy Spirit is involved in. You know, the day of Pentecost, the Spirit came on them, and they started to speak with languages from all over the Mediterranean. See, real languages, not gibberish nonsense that you hear in Pentecostal churches. They're not speaking languages. Those aren't the tongues of the Bible. They're speaking gibberish. But no, when the Holy Ghost came upon them, they spake languages, real languages, and all these people from around the Mediterranean that were Jews, that were law-abiding Jews on the day of Pentecost, heard it in their own language. Why? Because they were able to speak the languages of all those people miraculously by God's provision of the Holy Ghost. But these three are one. That shows Jesus is God. And it reminds me of that verse that proclaims how 
being in the form of God, he, in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he took upon himself a form of a servant and had no reputation and so forth. Because why? He's in the form of God and he's equal with God because he's part of God. The three that are one, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. All right, that's it for tonight. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you for being part of it and the fellowship, watching it or listening to it. God bless you.